WSRE presents Food for Thought, in-depth presentations on political, social, and cultural topics. On September 26, 2009, Fox News Channel commentator Morton Kondracki addressed the Panhandle Tiger Bay Club in a speech entitled, What's Right and Wrong in Washington? He discussed President Obama's first year in office. The presentation was recorded at New World Landing in downtown Pensacola. If you would, please give a warm Tiger Bay welcome to Mr. Morton Kondracki. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate that. Congratulations on your election. Unanimous election, that's, that's un unusual. Somebody get elected <laughs> unanimously without any objection. Well, I'm, I'm really honored to be um, here at the legendary Tiger Bay Club. You really are famous on the speech-making circuit. I mean, everybody, uh, every, everybody I know practically either has been a speaker of yours or, uh, or wants to be. So you've got your, your, your um, reputation is, uh, goes far and wide. Um, I'm, I'm not only, any of you who ever watched uh, the McLaughlin Group or watch Fox News now, uh, will know that I'm not only glad to be here, um, but I'm glad to be anywhere where I can finish a sentence without getting contradicted. <laughs> <clears throat> um, uh, the McLaughlin group, uh, you know, Fred, Fred Barnes and I sort of traveled together, um, and uh, we, we decamped from the McLaughlin group in, in 1998 and went to the Fox News Channel. Uh, and um, I can tell you that things are a lot more mentally healthy at uh, Fox News than they were at the McLaughlin Group, and uh, also, of course, fair and balanced. Um, on the Beltway Boys, <clears throat> which unfortunately is now not on the air anymore, um, uh, I'm the fair and balanced one. I mean, Fred Barnes' initials may be F and B, but I'm the fair and balanced one. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and in case you didn't know, and I, since most of you are, are Fox News viewers, um, but if you don't know, um, I'm, uh, I'm a political moderate. Um, the uh, liberals all think I'm a conservative. Conservatives all think I'm a liberal. Fred, Fred says that I'm a mushy moderate. Uh, Mitch McConnell, who, you know, the uh, Senate Republican leader, says I'm a militant moderate. I like that better. Uh, but whatever, I will try to give you a fair and balanced assessment of Barack Obama's first eight months in office and the larger political climate um, that, that uh, we're operating in in Washington. Uh, but first, I have to say, I give, give you a little report on the mentality of my brothers and sisters in the media in, in Washington, D.C. Um, on the one hand, uh, they're, they're, they're a little worried about Barack Obama. They l love, I mean, it is really true that the mainstream media, most of, the, of, of my friends in the mainstream media, lean liberal. They were ecstatic that Barack Obama became president of the United States. They still think that he is a great story, and he is, of course. I mean, the first African-American president of the United States um, is, is a fantastic historical moment for the United States to go through, given, uh, given our history. But the media, you know, being liberal, look at him and, and, uh, and are rooting for him nonstop. Furthermore, he and Michelle Obama are just a fabulous story, and if you put Michelle or Barack Obama on the cover of any magazine, uh, it sells out, right? So that's, that's another reason that the media have enough trouble these days uh, economically that, uh, that to have a, a telegenic, photogenic president of the United States who will automatically sell your, sell your publication out is a, gr is a great boon. Um, secondly, an e uh, equally important value to, to journalism is conflict. Um, and uh, Barack Obama is engendering, is engendering a lot of conflict. Um, most uh, of the media deplore what went on at the tea parties and the, and the town meetings this summer, but they really secretly love to put on television people waving fists at one another because it, you know, it's action, it's conflict. Uh, it's not particularly pretty that, uh, that the media love conflict, but it's true, they, they, they really do. Now, besides conflict and hero worship, the other great uh, value uh, of uh, the great uh, uh, theme of the mainstream media, and all media, in fact, in America, unfortunately, is scandal. Now, the best kind of scandal is a, uh, is a sex scandal. Uh, the next best kind of scandal is a political scandal. 
And if there's none, neither of them, then we'll take a, a financial scandal. So um, the, the Washington media wa were in love uh, with Bill Clinton because he, <laughs> he had a financial scandal, Whitewater. He had a political scandal. Remember the selling of the Lincoln bedroom, overnights in the Lincoln bedroom for political cash. And then there was Monica Lewinsky. So uh, in the fond memory of, uh, of uh, my brother and sister uh, in the media, this is known as a trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this past year, you know, we've had, a, we've had lots of financial scandals with uh, bonuses for executives <laughs> and Bernie Madoff, I guess, is the, is the, the all-time crowning uh, financial scandal. Um, Acorn right now is a big political scandal for people on the right. Um, Joe Wilson's yelling, you lie at the president is a big scandal as far as my friends at MSNBC are concerned. I don't really have many friends at MSNBC, but I <laughs> pretend that they're my friends. And then we have Mark Sanford, um, the, um, the, uh, the governor of South Carolina. I think he's still governor of South Carolina, who of course um, uh, not only you know, had a girlfriend in, in, uh, in Argentina, but used state funds to um, to go visit her and wrote it off as, as, a, as a trade mission and stuff like that. So this is sort of a state level trifecta that, uh, that we have in, uh, in, uh, in Mark Sanford. And um, Mark Sanford gives rise to the following story. Um, it seems that for reasons unexplained, Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton and Mark Sanford on an, are on an airplane and the airplane crashes and uh, they, uh, they all die. And they go to see St. Peter. And St. Peter says, okay, you guys, here's the way it works here. Uh, Newt Gingrich, you go into that room mark number one. So Newt Gingrich goes into the room mark number one, and uh, the door slams shut, shut behind him, and a trap door opens, and in rushes a rabid hyena. And uh, St. Peter's voice comes down and says, um, Newt Gingrich, you have sinned, and your penalty is to spend all eternity being chased by this hyena. Uh, says to Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, you go into room number two. Bill Clinton goes into room number two, door slams shut behind him, trap door opens, and in slithers the largest python that has ever existed in the history of the world. And St. Peter's voice comes out and says, Bill Clinton, you've sinned and your penalty is to spend eternity being chased by the snake. Third door, Mark Sanford gets shoved in, door slams shut, trap door opens, and in walks Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> And St. Peter's voice comes down and says, Lindsay Lohan, you have sinned. And, <laughs> and she has. She has. So back to, back, back to serious business now. <clears throat> How is Obama doing? Um, well, the bottom line is that, uh, that he is losing his luster. Um, the average of all of his poll ratings uh, right now is 51% approval. Uh, which is 12 points below below that, below the average of the last eight presidents, that uh, um, all the way back to uh, to Harry Truman, uh, newly elected, actually Dwight Eisenhower, newly elected presidents, uh, and it's 12, uh, it's um, 15 points d down from Obama's high. Now it's still still a majority approval of people in the country, but uh, but it uh, it was he was at 67 percent. Uh, not so long ago in February, and this is the steepest decline of any of these eight newly elected presidents. Um, and I think there are two reasons for this. Uh, one is overreaching, and the other is misunderstanding uh, the message of the 2008 election. First of all, instead of concentrating on immediate business, namely the economy, which everybody, which is the number one item on every um, uh, everybody's agenda, as the, as the polls indicate, um, and do, dealing with foreign policy crises like Afghanistan and Iraq and North Korea and Iran, which were unavoidable for, for any president, um, he decided that he was going to sort of re, remake the whole future of the American economy and do it all in the, in the first year of his presidency. And I think it's more than he's capable of doing and also that he decided that he would tra transform America's relationship with, with, uh, with the whole world. And the, the theme of the, or the, the mission of the Obama administration was telegraphed in the very first days of the administration by Rahm Emanuel, uh, the White House Chief of Staff, 
who said, you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. And so as Obama conceived it, he would use the, the, um, um, the, the economic crisis that we were in to do all these other things as the, as the opportunity to remake um, the financial uh, system, to re repair American education, to um, reform the health system of the country, to um, uh, solve the problem of global warming, um, and so on. And, and he was gonna, and he was gonna put it all on the agenda at, uh, at the same time. Um, and this is just more than, proving to be more than the, than the system could bear. Now, I do really think that he's right about, um, about uh, uh, this, this element of the picture, that America's standard of living is going to decline, uh, and our leadership in the world is at risk if we don't get our fiscal house in order. Um, and we, you know, we've got to also develop a world-class education system or else we're going to lose out in the high-tech uh, competitive environment of the 21st century. Um, and a key to solving the fiscal crisis um, is, uh, is getting the health system in order. Uh, the question is, in how do you do this? What, what is the sequencing of this? But there's no question but what it's got to be done. 72 million people of the baby boom generation are on the verge of retiring. They're beginning to retire, uh, actually, already. And um, we've made promises to them. Uh, for retirement benefits, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid for, for uh, advanced seniors, generally speaking, um, uh, nursing home care, long-term care, that, that are so out of line with what our econ economy can afford that just by 2040, four items in the national budget, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the national debt will account for 20% of GDP. Now, 20% of GDP is what the entire federal government uh, uh, uses up right now. That's the Defense Department, the Border Patrol, the National Parks, um, Health and Human Services, the FBI, everything. So what this means is that we are either going to have to double our taxes on our kids in which case they are not going to be as productive as they could possibly be. You won't have that money available for investment. Or uh, we're going to have to slice programs uh, in half, which we, which we don't want to do, but nobody wants to do. It's al almost impossible to slice everything in half, the defense budget, the FBI, the Border Patrol, and all that, and, and um, uh, Social Security. You're, not, you're simply not going to do that. Or we're going to inflate our currency in order to pay for this, making the dollar less valuable. Uh, foreigners are not going to want to buy our debt. Uh, we will cease to be the world's reserve currency, and uh, and our leadership in the world will uh, will decline. So that is what we face. It's it's a it's a done deal. It's there on paper. It's unavoidable. We have to do something about it. And you notice that two of the biggest items on this agenda, Medicare and Medicaid, and they are the biggest items of those, of those four, are health programs. Um, and uh, health, now the, the problem is that health, co health costs in America continue to rise at six, seven, or eight percent a year. Our economy grows at two, three, or in, in the best case, four percent a year, which means that um, it's, it's double the health costs are rising at double the rate of the, of the economy. Right now, 17% of the entire American economy is eaten up with health care health costs. By 2025, 30% of the entire economy will be eaten up by, by health care costs. We spend 50% more, and in some cases 100% more, on health care than any other industrialized country in the world. Our, everybody says, oh, we have the best health care system in the world. It is not true. Our, our, our uh, life, life expectancy is not uh, any better. As a matter of fact, it's a lot worse than most countries in the world, most industrialized countries in the world. Uh, our, life, our healthy life expectancy, that is, how many years can you expect to live before you get a disabling chronic disease, is 24th among the, among the countries of the world. We're just, we're just behind Israel and just ahead of, ahead of Cyprus 
uh, on, on that account. We're, we're not, the, we don't have the best infant mortality uh, statistics in the world, and we're spending all this money. So repairing the, the health care system is something that we've, that, that we've got to do. The problem is um, that, that what Obama has done, and the Democrats in Congress even more than, uh, than Obama, is that they, they looked at the, the results of the 2008 election, and they thought that, that, that they had a mandate to transform the economy and American foreign policy, for that matter, in a, in a, in a distinctly liberal direction, in, in, a, in a big government direction. That, that this was a mandate for liberalism, when in fact what it was really was a rejection of the, what the, the way the Republicans had managed for the last uh, eight years. Um, and, uh, you know, George Bush, when he was, pre during George Bush's presidency, the national debt doubled. Um, we, um, we uh, George Bush and the Republicans presided over the biggest financial disaster since the Great Depression. They, they were there, it was on their watch, uh, it developed, it's not all their fault to be sure. A lot of the stuff that, uh, that happened was, was the, the consequence of mistakes that were made in the Clinton administration. Nonetheless, it happened on their watch and the public was reacting against them and, and also to, to the unpopularity of the Gulf War. That's why uh, Barack Obama and the Democrats uh, came to power at the, in the size they did. Um, so, but, but nonetheless, a lot of Democrats looked at the 2008 election results and the, and the, um, uh, the exit polls, and they saw that, uh, that the growth groups in the American electorate, young people, uh, Hispanics, um, secular, seculars, people who don't go to church very much, which are a growing group of the population, well-educated people, uh, all went, uh, moderates, all went, um, uh, all went democratic. And what the Republican base was reduced largely to Southerners, to um, older people, to less well-educated people, to very religious people, and those are kind of shrinking elements of the electorate, and they said, aha, the future belongs to us. And um, they, um, and they forgot to, not to notice that these same exit polls um, showed that, uh, that only 22% of the electorate declared itself liberal, self-identified as liberals. 34% identified themselves as, um, as conservatives. And 44% identifies themselves as moderate. Hooray for us. We should be running the country. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not. Um, and, and also the Democrats uh, forgot to notice that, uh, that, that when people were asked, do you think that the government should get bigger and do more things or that the government should do less things, only 51% said that the government should do more things and this was in the middle of, a, of an impending horrific economic crisis when, you, when people do, do really look to the government to, to, to get us out of it. So this was not a mandate for liberalism. but. You don't tell Nancy Pelosi that. Um, so uh, what I think happened is that the 2000 election created an opportunity for the Democrats to show that they could manage the economy better than the Republicans had. And, and if they did, uh, then, then maybe the Democrats really would uh, be the party of the future. But if they failed, then they won't be. I mean, this was an opportunity. It was not a guarantee. And I think the... Uh, um, the, Dem the Democrats overread, overread their mandate. So I think that if Obama had tackled the economic crisis and dealt with these various foreign policy crisis, crises and maybe put financial services reform at the top of the agenda, and which would have been a comparatively easy thing to get through given the fact that everybody was scared to death about the possible collapse of, of, of the banking system, that he might have um, um, develop the sense of confidence in the country that would have given him the, the, uh, the running room to reform the, uh, the, the health care system, reform the education system, and do something about energy and the environment. Um, in fact, in fa and, and you know, there are some signs of success. We don't know how the economy is going to come out. The stock market is certainly doing better. Uh, corporate profits are, are, are up, but there's still a lot of problems in the economy, uh, unemployment being the the, uh, the worst of it, and we don't know that we're not going to go back into a, into, a, into a second recession or have a second banking crisis. I think the jury is still out, but 
but um, but you know there are signs of progress that um, that that things are improving on uh, on some regards and um, um, but in, but as I say, instead of instead of concentrating on the economy, um, uh, he's tried to do everything all at once in the, uh, in, in this first year, and um, especially to force through a, uh, a health care bill this year, and also climate change and uh, and and a new energy uh, policy all in this year, and uh, all of them are hugely controversial, and they're and it's not clear that th that they're actually going to pass, and. The second mistake involved in this was to, instead of leading on this, give the, the lead in drafting the legislation on climate and um, health care to the Democratic Congress. Now, um, the, Democrat, the leadership of the Democratic Congress in Washington is utterly unrepresentative of the country at large. Nancy Pelosi uh, is not from Kansas. She's not from Florida. She's not from Ohio. She's from San Francisco. She occupies a 90% Democratic district. Uh, Henry Waxman, who she uh, installed as the chairman of the, um, of the uh, uh, House uh, Educa um, uh, Commerce Committee, um, Energy and Commerce Committee, is um, from West Hollywood. He's not from Florida or, or Ohio or Nebraska either. Uh, and he comes from a 70% Democratic district. The chairman of the, the, the committee that writes all the tax legislation, Charlie Rangel, he's from Harlem. Uh, that's a 93% Democratic district. I mean, these people do not understand how, what, what the frame of mind is of people all, all across America. Um, and uh, now, Senator, uh, and on the Senate side, Harry Reid is from Nevada, which is, went, 55% for for Obama. That's a it's a swing state, but uh, his most of the senators uh, in his in his um, uh, caucus are liberal, and his two sub leaders, and some of whom are uh, act a lot smarter than he does. Frankly, uh, he's constantly having to apologize for himself. Um, Dick Durbin is from Illinois, 62% Democratic state. Chuck Schumer is from New York, 63% Democratic state. So uh, the, the, the policy, the, these policies are being drafted in, in, on, with, with a liberal bent that is resisted by a lot of people out in the country. They, they, uh, and, it's, and it's not going over well. Uh, and, the, and here's the way it works in Washington. Uh, in the House of Representatives, the majority and this is true, Republican majority, Democratic majority, doesn't make any difference. The majority treats the minority like mushrooms. They keep them in the dark, they throw manure on top of them, they <laughs> cut off their heads and then they eat them alive, right? Um, I mean, it is, what, it is what the Democrats did to the Republicans for 30 years. Then the Republicans took over in 1994 and they were in charge from 1994 to 2006 and that's the way they treated the Democrats. The Democrats came back in 2006, and that's the way they're treating the Republicans. They don't listen to them. They don't. They don't. Uh, they don't give them the time of day. They, as I say, treat them like treat them like mushrooms. So, the House Democrats passed their stimulus package without any Republican input. Um, they passed their budget without any Republican input. They um, they passed a, a 2009 spending bill filled with pork um, without any without any Republican uh, input voted down, summarily voted down every Republican amendment uh, and so on. So the, uh, they wrote a cap and trade bill their way, no Republican input, and they've got, they've passed out of committee three different health care bills, uh, all with, without Republican ideas or Republican input. And they're sitting there, they're afraid to pass them because there are a lot of Democrats who are occupying marginal seats uh, some of them, you know, that, that uh, um, John McCain carried, and they're scared to death to vote out these bills because they're afraid that when the Senate gets done with health care or, or energy, uh, they're all going to be embarrassed by what they voted for. So they're, they're sitting there waiting to see what, what, uh, what the Senate did. Um, and, and, it's, and it really is true, the criticisms that you hear about these, these House bills, that, that they, do, they contain this public option for, for health care, and the, the way the thing is designed 
the the uh, the public option according that that uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Henry Waxman have put together will pay um, doctors and hospitals what Medicare pays, and it will be so it will be it will be cheap. Hospitals and doctors cannot operate on with with that kind of um, income as their sole source of income. They you know they just they just can't. And insurance companies um, cannot compete with Medicare, uh, and they will be put out of business. And so we will have a single payer system the way Canada does. And Canada's experience is that there are just long delays before you get um, any kind of a, 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 a treatment specialist treatment. So, you know, in America clearly does not want to go the way of Canada, but the liberals really want us to go the way of Canada. They want us, they want us all in Medicare. Now, Medicare works for a lot of people in this audience, I'm sure, but, but Medicare is going broke. And Medicare, everybody's got to buy supplemental insurance, right, with Medicare. So Medicare is not really, is really a good model for, for the whole healthcare system of the United States. But boy, the liberals really want to, want to put it over. And the, the Senate help, help Committee, the one that Ted Kennedy was the chairman of uh, until he died, um, uh, has the same sort of liberal uh, message. Now, if, if Ted Kennedy had lived, Ted Kennedy would be in there negotiating with Republicans to try to get half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf or whatever he possibly could have. But in the absence of Teddy, Teddy Kennedy as a, as a, as a really experienced negotiator, uh, what you basically have is, is ideological combat. The only bipartisan committee that is working on health care right now is the Senate Finance Committee with Max Baucus, and he's having a very difficult time getting uh, reconciling his Democrats and his Republicans. The, the Democrats don't like what he's doing because it's not liberal enough. The Republicans don't like what he's doing because it's, it's not conservative enough, and it's, it remains to be seen whether anything can come out of that committee and whether what comes out of that committee can survive on the floor uh, and whether whatever the Senate produces can be, um, will be bought by the liberals in, in the House of Representatives. So whether Obama is actually going to get a health care bill uh, this year, I do not know. Now, one way of looking at this is that the Democrats cannot fail to pass a health care bill. This is the top item on the agenda of their president. They are in charge of the, of, the, of, of the Congress. They have huge majorities in both the House and the Senate. They've got the presidency. This is their top agenda item. They don't pass it. And what is everybody going to think? You know, they're going to think just the way they thought in 1994 when the Hil Hillary Care failed that they don't know what they're doing and it's going to be bad for them uh, uh, in the next election. Now, um, of, all, of, of all the mistakes that I think Obama has been making, I think the worst of them is that he, it, it is not, and it's not entirely his fault, but he promised that he was going to work on ending the vicious partisanship that has taken over Washington and made it impossible for us to solve the really big problems that face, that face the United States. He said that he was going to take red America and blue America and reunite it into the United States of America. You remember that? That was his famous speech. And he said it over and over and over again that, the t that this time of rancor has got to end. That we've got to get together. We've got to reach across party lines. We've got to solve our problems on a bipartisan basis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, somebody else made a, problem, a promise like that. It was, it was George Bush uh, in, two, in 2000 said that he was going to be a uniter and not a divider. Um, uh, unfortunately, by the end of, of his administration, I mean, I like to say that, uh, you know, uh, if you look back in American history, Henry Clay goes down as the great compromiser, and um, um, uh, Ronald Reagan goes down as the great communicator, uh, well, George W. Bush goes down in history as the great polarizer. Um, uh, that is to say that, that the gap in approval ratings between Democrats and Republicans for George Bush was the widest of any president in, in history up to that time. And that included, that in, that, who's been polled anyway, they didn't used to have polls in Andrew Jackson's time and Abraham Lincoln's time, but um, the, FDR did not have that wide approval rating. He was a very controversial president. Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, even Richard Nixon. 
uh, was not hated by uh, Democrats as much as Democrats hated, um, ha hated George Bush. Well, guess what? Uh, Barack Obama's uh, disapproval ratings among Republicans and approval ratings among Democrats are just as wide as George W. Bush's. Um, the, uh, in August, the Gallup poll showed that by 86 to 8, Democrats thought that he was doing a great job. And, and um, by 16% to 76%, our Republicans disapproved of him, which is a 70-point gap. It's just the same as, as, as George Bush's gap was. Um, and in Washington, the, the Republicans are opposing everything that, that Obama's doing, partly because they haven't been listened to, they haven't been reached out to, and partly because they are, um, they're just determined to restore their own reputation among the Republican base by uh, being fiscally conservative, and uh, Barack Obama and the Democrats are being anything but fiscally conservative. Uh, and in the current uh, environment, um, the best that, uh, that I think Obama can possibly hope for is maybe three out of, all of, out of the 218 Republicans in the entire Congress of the United States. He may get three senators if he's lucky. Uh, maybe only one, maybe only Olympia Snow. So um, I think that, that Obama and the Democrats should have done a lot more to include Republicans, as I said, uh, in, in, in policy making. They should woo them and listen to them and, and compromise with them and reach out to them uh, and all that stuff. Now, I don't know whether that would work or not. Uh, Obama did invite a lot of Republicans down for social hours uh, in the early days of the administration and tried to get them to vote for his, uh, for his stimulus package, and then none of them did, um, except three. And uh, that, that was three senators, and one of them, Arlen Specter, is now a Democrat. Um, so, um, you know, so Rahm Emanuel, who is a famous potty mouth, right, a uh, really tough partisan Chicago politician, a veteran of the Clinton Wars and all that stuff, um, reportedly said uh, to Obama, see, this was after the stimulus vote, see, you can't trust those blanky blankers uh, so let's blank them, right? Um, you can fill in the word. Starts with F. Um, and and the sad fact is that uh, that in Washington, uh, both parties increasingly spend more time uh, trying to defeat the purposes of the other party than they do trying to figure out constructive solutions to the problems that that America faces. And it's true. It's true of both parties. It's not just the Republicans. It's not true the Democrats. Uh, when, when you've got a, uh, when the Democrats are in control of Congress and the, the Republicans all say no, the, they're, they're obstructionists, they're the party of no. When the Republicans are in power, the Democrats do exactly the same thing and the, and the Democrats accuse the Republicans of being obstructionists and guess what they are. So they, ju they, just, never, they just never work together in, uh, to, to, get these, to get these problems solved. And somehow they have this hope that that they will pulverize the opposition, and they will get all the power, and they will finally be able to put, make America look like them. And uh, the Democrats right now are as close to having full power as they possibly could have. I mean, May, Lyndon Johnson had more after the 64 election, and he got a lot done. The Democrats, you know, have right now have a, an 80-seat majority in the House of Representatives, a 20-seat majority, 60 votes in the in the United States Senate. Um, the the president is ready to sign what they produce, and yet they may not be able to get it passed, largely because the Republicans have been able to rile up uh, constituency groups in the country over real flaws in the health care system and the the financial. Uh, program of the of the Democratic Party. And you know this polarization is really dangerous for, for America. Um, in order to get the big problems solved, if we're ever going to get them solved, that is the financial crisis, the health care crisis, the energy crisis uh, and stuff, you're just going to have to have bipartisan deals. It just is going to have to work that way. The problems are too big. You're going to have to reach solve them by consensus. To get the fiscal house in order, Republicans are going to have to agree to some tax increases. And Democrats are going to have to reduce spending, and they're going to have to 
convince older people to shave back not on the benefits that current retirees receive, but on the promises that are being made to future generations, um, future retirees. In other words, they're going to have to adjust inflation indexes and stuff like that and, and force people to frankly save in the future to save for their own retirement more than, than current retirees ever, ever were required to do. Um, uh, so it's got to be done. It's got to be done on a bipartisan basis, or all these else these problems are never going to are, are are never going to be solved. Now George Bush tried to re to reform Social Security, and uh, what did the Democrats do? They scared old people into thinking that he's going to that he's going to take away your current benefits. He was never going to take away anybody's current benefits. He was going to try to offer the opportunity of a, uh, of investing some of your tax money, this is for younger workers, in, in the stock market if you wanted to do it. Now, maybe it was a good idea, maybe it was a, it was a bad idea, but nonetheless, you know, it was never going to affect anybody, any current retirees' actual benefits. But the Democrats scared uh, seniors into believing that it would, and the Democrats pounded and pounded away on that, and, um, and so George Bush failed to, to reform Social Security. Now Obama and, and, and Max Baucus want to cut back uh, 700 billion, I think it's $700 billion over a 10-year period on Medicare and Medicaid outlays. They want to do it by making hospitals and, and doctors operate more efficiently. They are not going to reduce the benefits that any retiree actually receives. And guess what? Now the Republicans are scaring old people into thinking that their benefits are going to be cut. And seniors are, are, are scared and they're afraid that, uh, that Obama is going to undercut mm -hmm. Medicare. And so, so, and they didn't vote for him anyway. And so now they're going to, you know, now they're, uh, now they're turning against him. It's the same old stuff. Uh, education. Uh, I mean, we, we are in a real pickle from the standpoint of, of education. One third of all kids who enter high school do not graduate in four years across the country. 50% of the kids in the biggest cities, 50% of minorities do not graduate in, 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 in four years. Some of them don't, most of them don't graduate at all. The kids do, who do graduate, only one third of high school graduates are proficient in math and science. We, are, we rank 37th in the country, in the world, in math and science scores. We are having our lunch eaten by India and China, or we will in the future, which where the kids are, the kids go to school in India and China twice, uh, for, they study twice, twice as many hours as American kids do, doing homework and after school uh, and all that kind of stuff. They are producing per cap, you know, um, far more in, in gross numbers of PhDs, and their PhDs will work for a lot less money than our PhDs, and um, and they you know they are not any longer just producing um, low low tech products. They are now comp going to compete with us increasingly on the in the highest technology in the future. And if we don't repair our education system, we are going to be left in the dust. Now there's a chance. This is one area where there is just a chance that there might be some bipartisan agreement. Um, what we've got to do, obviously, is pay teachers more money, and Republicans have got to. You know, vote the tax money to, uh, to, to pay teachers so we can get the best people in the country to teaching. And Democrats are going to have to buck the teachers' unions in order to, uh, to put professional standards into play so that the, that the teachers that we have can get rewarded on the basis of how much they improve the, the performance of kids in the classroom. Now, this is one area where, our, where the president and Arne Duncan, his education secretary, really are courageous. They are willing to buck the unions. The unions are furious with them. If the Republicans will not uh, try to thwart Obama on this score, we might actually get something done. That's, that's, it's one place of, of good news. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna make us energy independent, you know, or reduce our dependency on f imported oil from the, from the Middle East, um, you know, and, and go, to, go to cleaner fuels, we're going to have to have a compromise on that as well. I um, mean, the Democrats are going to have to go for nuclear power, and, um, and they don't want to do that. Uh, they're going to have to go for some offshore drilling of natural gas. They don't want to do that. 
uh, and the and the and the Republicans are going to have to to uh, to agree to uh, to put taxes on on dirty fuels, and they don't want they, they don't want to do that. Similarly, with the immigration problem, I mean, you know, uh, the conservatives are right; we've got to control the border, but the liberals are right as well that we have to let workers in. We don't have enough uh, enough workers to do the work that we have to do, especially at the high tech end. You know, we need to import skilled labor. And we need to import very low skilled labor too. And we ought to have a regular way of doing it so that people, you know, we get we get the labor we need and some of them leave and some of them stay. And we can allow some of them to become citizens and some of them will, will go back home. But it's got to be a regular basis instead of having this crazy illegal immigration system where You've got these people hiding all the time and being paid lower wages and being exploited. Um, uh, and if if the uh, if illegal aliens who are um, who, who live here for you know now ha most of their lives and have kids here who go to school and ought to be able to go to universities um, and you know become American citizens instead of instead of hiding in the shadows all the time. And not paying full taxes and still being a burden on the on the system. I mean, we we need a comprehensive immigration system, and we haven't been able to have one because of partisan rancor. George Bush couldn't get a, a comprehensive immigration reform through. John McCain was for it. We really have made strides in controlling the border, but if Obama tries it, I'm not sure he can get it because, uh, uh, you know, um, there's just going to be a lot of rancor about it. Now, how do we get here? Well, part of it is gerrymandering of congressional districts. I mean, every 10 years, you know, we, we redraw the lines of, of congressional districts. And the way it works is that the, that, um, the parties at, at the state level, assisted by supercomputers in Washington, slice down the middle of streets and around lakes. And, you know, um, they draw these crazy looking districts uh, for the purpose of keeping incumbents in office and securing safe districts for either Republican or Democratic candidates. Um, in uh, 1990, in 1976, only a quarter of the members of Congress got elected by 20 points or more, a quarter. In 2008, half, half of all the members of Congress were elected in districts that gave them more than a 20% lead, known as landslide districts. Now that was all because of the gerrymandering of the districts. And the, the bad consequence of this is that if you're a Republican um, in one of these safe Republican districts, you don't have to worry. You don't, you don't have to reach out across party lines. You don't have to listen to Democrats and try to appeal to them and try to develop moderate solutions to problems. You're worried about somebody to your right uh, running against you in a primary. Same thing in the, in the Democratic Party. If you're, you know, uh, reaching out to, uh, to Republicans in your district is not what you know what your what your, what the system impels you to do. You're worried that some super lib is gonna is gonna uh, rag on you and and uh, and you're and you're gonna get beaten in a primary uh, the same way. So you know uh, it's the mo the moveon.org left is 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 after moderate uh, 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 Democrats and the club for growth is after uh, moderate uh, Republicans. And basically, moderates have been have been rendered an, an extinct species uh, in the Republican Party. There, there, there are hardly any of them left. Um, and if in this election, if the Democrats lose seats, which looks like they will do, who's gonna who's gonna get the axe? It's gonna be Democrats, blue dog Democrats, serving in mod, in in swing districts, where they you know they're Democrats, but they they have to know what Republicans think in order to get elected in those districts. And, um, and you know, the wave is gonna sweep over them and wash them back out and you'll have Republicans sitting in those seats and, um, and they're not gonna be moderates either. So, um, you know, th what results is polarization. Now, Iowa and Arizona have a different system. They have, instead of having their state legislatures draw up the maps on a, on a highly partisan basis, they have a system whereby um, um, independent commissions draw the lines, and generally speaking, they're, they're, they're not drawn to, to prevent, um, uh, to keep uh, incumbents in office, they're drawn to be competitive, and generally speaking, the, the members of Congress, as a result, are, are more moderate. And besides the party and the gerrymanderings, you've got all these consultants who spend all their time trying to attack the, the, the opposition. You know, I, I get emails, I must get 
a thousand emails a day, and they're all from these political. Uh, I don't even open half of them because I know what they say without even looking at them. But generally speaking, they're all attack ads. Uh, they're attack emails. They're blistering about you know this guy's no good, that woman's no good. It's you know it's from from one side or the other. It's just it's just savage. And there are people who make a living uh, all day long, all year long, you know, uh, dreaming up attacks uh, on the other party. And then we have the media. Um, we have uh, radio talk shows on the right. Uh, we have bloggers on the left. Uh, some of my colleagues at Fox News, you know, are, are rabble-rousing on the right. Uh, MSNBC is almost entirely rabble-rousing on the left. And, you know, and, and, they, and each side is whipping their constituencies into, into frenzies. Um, and and, the, and the, the, um, there are certain, I know a lot of you watch only Fox News. I encourage you to watch Fox News, by all means, watch Fox News, but, but you but you got to listen to some other, uh, you, even, even if only if you want to know what the enemy thinks, uh, you should just tune in to MSNBC and see what it sounds like. It's horrible, but, uh, but, but, you'll, but you'll, at least you'll learn about, you know, how bad it is from, from, an, from another point of view. And, you know, and what, what we've got is, you know, my, my pal Charles Krauthammer, who is the, the, I guess now the most popular person uh, on the, the special report panel, coined the, the, the expression Bush, der he's a psychiatrist, by the way, he's a trained psychiatrist, Bush derangement syndrome, you know, <laughs> the, which was the, the hatred that all these Democrats felt for George Bush. You know, they accused him of being a, a, a torturer and a liar for getting us into Iraq. You know, he knew uh, that, that uh, Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but he wanted to go to war and so on. And, um, you know, everybody says that Joe, Joe Wilson shouldn't have uh, yelled, you lie at President Obama, and he certainly shouldn't, but they conveniently forget that in 2005, George Bush was booed by Democrats on the floor of the House of Representatives when he, when he presented his, his um, State of the Union address. Um, so that was Bush derangement syndrome. Now you've got something that could equally be called Obama derangement syndrome. Um, you know, uh, Glenn Beck, you know, who's yeah, very popular on Fox News, and, and Rush Limbaugh accused um, Obama of being a racist. Uh, Glenn Beck said something like, in Obama's, uh, Obama's America, all white people are racist. And you get Jimmy Carter, who says that anybody, you know, uh, the overwhelming majority of the people who oppose um, uh, Barack Obama are racist. And you get people at these, at these tea parties who are holding signs with Obama with a, with a uh, Hitler mustache. I mean, it is just getting to be hysterical out there. Um, and it's, and, it, and, it, and it, it just drives everybody further and further apart uh, all the time. I mean, it's, it's there, you got the birthers on the one side who think that Obama is a secret Muslim, that he really wasn't born in Hawaii, that he was born, I don't know where, in the Sudan somewhere, or he's really Osama bin Laden's kid, or something like that. Um, and then you've got the, you know, you've got the, uh, the truthers who think that, that uh, George Bush had something to do with uh, instigating 9-11 so that he could go to war. You know, I mean, it is, just, it is just crazy out there. It's over the top, and it's hysterical, and it's, um, you know, and, you, and the result of which you got people going around thinking that Obama's health care plan really did include death panels, where a bunch of bureaucrats were going to sit there and decide who lives and who dies. It was nonsense. I mean, this all arose from, a, from a, um, a, 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 an amendment that was put in by Johnny Isaacson, the Republican senator from Georgia, that doctors should be encouraged to discuss with their patients how they wanted to end their lives if they wanted to have that discussion. You know, do you want to have a living will or do you just want to be left to the tender mercies of whatever happens in the ICU when you die? That, that was it. And that got blown into the, you know, there are going to be death panels, and people are going to be put to death uh, who don't want to be put to death. Newt Gingrich was in favor of this at one stage, and then Newt Gingrich saw that, that, um, that there was political hay to be made by yelling about death panels, so he started yelling about death panels. I mean, it, it, you know, we've got to get into, into a civil discussion in this country, and I'm afraid 
we're operating in the in the uh, in the opposite direction. And and I'm really kind of pessimistic, as a matter of fact, about whether America is going to get its problems solved at the rate that, at the rate we're going. Um, and, um, and and now it's 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 up to the president to lead on this issue. I mean, we we elect a president to be the leader. And Obama promised that he was going to reach out and that he was going to listen to everybody and that he was going to, you know, try to meld things together. And he hasn't been able to do it. I'm sure George Bush uh, said with the, with the best of intentions that he was going to do it, and he failed to do it. But somebody at some point has got to do it, or the public has, the, who, which is 44 percent of the public self-identifies as moderate, is going to have to start demanding from its politicians to stop screaming at each other and start sitting down with the opposition and trying to work things out so that we solve these problems. If we don't solve these problems, what's going to happen is that our children are going to live a, a life that is much less prosperous than the life that we've been privileged to live. Um, they are going to live in a world in which the United States is not going to be the leading power of the world. The 21st century is going to belong to China and not to the, the, way, the way the 20th century belonged to the United States of America, because we're going to be broke. Um, and, we, and so the only way we're going to solve this, this thing is, is, to be, is, to be, is, to, is to come together somehow. Now, on a much more mundane level, let me just talk about the Republican Party a little bit and what the, what the 2010 election is, and then I'll, I'll get done. I mean, at the rate things are going, the, the, the Democrats are going to lose maybe 20 seats, but I don't think they're going to lose control of the, of the, House, uh, of the House of the Senate. Um, that, I mean, conceivably they could. You could write a scenario where if Obama fails in foreign policy and he fails and, they, and the unemployment rate is still going up uh, in 2010 and he doesn't get his health care system through, the country is going to look at him and say this was a failed operation and let's put the Republicans back in charge of the Congress. And then maybe he'll have to deal across party lines in order to get anything done at all. And there's, you know, it's true that Bill Clinton did get a lot done with uh, when he had Newt Gingrich to deal with, um, but um, you know th that, and it it could happen. But uh, at the rate things are going, probably what you're going to have is a little bit less Democratic House and Senate than uh, than you have now. Um, now, just on the foreign policy front, uh, I'll do this briefly, but we can we can talk about it. Obama is facing enormous challenges. His party does not want to win the war in Afghanistan. He, they want to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, they said that Afghanistan was the, was the good war because they thought Iraq was the bad war, and they didn't want to be, look weak on foreign policy. Now that Afghanistan is their problem, they want out. And I don't know whether Obama is, well, Obama said in March, we have got to win this war. This is not a war of choice. This is a war of necessity. If we get out of, of, of Afghanistan, the Taliban will come back and invite Osama bin Laden back, and, they, and, and um, Afghanistan will become a, a staging ground for attacks in Pakistan, which has nuclear weapons, the way um, Pakistan has been a sanctuary for attacks in Afghanistan. So I don't know what Obama's going to do uh, about this. He is wavering on this score. Um, Iran is another huge problem. I mean, he's got to organize the world to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons. Um, you know, everybody sort of thinks, well, maybe the Israelis will take care of the problem by bombing out the, uh, the Iranian nuclear installations. That is a very difficult task. They are scattered. Um, uh, there's a, um, there, I forget where I read this great story today. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. So the cover of the, the section of the, in, in the Wall Street Journal today about just how difficult it is for the Israelis to knock out. So, the, so it really is up to Obama to get the world organized uh, in order to stop them. Um, if Obama and the Democrats fail, um, um, what happens? I mean, I would like to think that the Republicans would nominate in 2012, you know, somebody who's a conservative, certainly they will, you know, somebody, but somebody who's a problem solver uh, somebody who's a who's a leader, somebody who maybe you can be a uniter. I mean, my favorite candidates are Mitch Daniels, the governor of Indiana. Great profile on Mitch Daniels, by the way, in today's Wall Street Journal. Um, he's a, he's a wonderful guy. Used to be OMB director under uh, under um, uh, George Bush. Um, another possibility, don't hear it very much, but it's whispered out there is David Petraeus. Uh, if we if we're facing foreign policy challenges, David Petraeus. 
uh, is believed to be a Republican and might decide to run for president. I mean, there are other good governors around um, who, who, you know, you would, you would hope that a, that, a, that a problem solver, a genuine problem solver, would, be, would become president. Um, so, but whoever's got elected, if a Republican gets elected in 2012, he or she is going to face the same. You notice I didn't su suggest Sarah Palin as the, as the next president of the United States. Please, Lord. No, Sarah Palin. Um, um, so uh, the, um, it's going to face the same problems, the same problems, and probably will not have absolute power to solve the problems in a, in a conservative way. They're going to have to make deals with, with Democrats in order to solve them. Let us hope that somebody uh, will, will bring us together. Now, I will, I will leave you with uh, remarks, uh, or I will end at least. I'm not going to leave you because I'm going to answer questions. With remarks from a rather unusual source. You would not think that this person would have said this, but it actually is Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck, in, in an interview with Time Magazine just after the 2008 election, said as follows, I am no Obama fan, but I am a fan of our country. He's my president, and we must have him succeed. If he fails, we all fail. <clears throat> and he went on, we've got to pull together because we are facing dark, dark times. I don't trust a single weasel in Washington. I don't care what party they are, Republican or Democrat. But unless we trust each other, unless we pull together, we're not going to make it. And to that remark from Glenn Beck, I say amen, and I will ask, answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Should Israel attack Iran's threat now? Boy, uh, well, I, I dealt with that a little bit. Um, the, the, you know, I, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It, 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 well, it depends. It depends on whether the Israelis have the capability to destroy enough of the Iranian nuclear potential and set it back, delay it long enough to make it worthwhile because the consequences of an, uh, of an Israeli attack are going to be catastrophic. I mean, what's going to happen is that the Iranians probably will close the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, there will be, you know, there will be the price of oil will skyrocket to $300 a barrel. Uh, the world economy will, you know, take a horrible blow. Uh, on the other hand, the Israelis are scared to death that if you put a nuclear weapon in the hands of the likes of Ahmadinejad, that he's going to use it. Um, or give it give it to terrorists, uh, and that, that that you know Israel is going to be wiped off the face of the earth, and they the Israelis, you know, firmly believe that. Um, now, if they don't have the capability uh, to knock out the the installations, it may not be worth doing. And in which case, what um, what we'd have to hope for is that we can develop anti missile defenses uh, capable of knocking down any rocket that that might be. Um, that might be fired. The problem there is that it's easy to hide a nuke in a in a PT boat and you know uh, roll it up to the shore by uh, by Tel Aviv and you know blow half of Israel away. That's the problem, and that's why the Israelis probably will attack.